Father, we pray that you would come among us now, that we would sense your presence, that you would become the dominant reality in our lives. Lord, we pray that that you would speak to us from your word. We pray that you would help us to understand who we are and what this place is. And we pray, Father, that you would work through the scriptures and through what we're about to explore together to transform us at the level of our appetites and our affections. Lord, we pray that you would deliver us from the expressive individualism of this modern age in which we live. Deliver us from the psychologized and sexualized and politicized environment in which we find ourselves and make us like Christ. And we pray that you would cause this discipleship to happen as we think about how the scriptures were intended by you to function for us. Lord, we pray that you would be at work. We pray that there would be everlasting pleasure for us as a result of our contemplation of what you've revealed in your word. We pray that you would enable us to find fullness of joy in your presence. And we pray, Lord, that that many people would be ministered to as a result of the time that we spend together here. We pray that your people would be built up, that the church would be strengthened, and that, that your name would be glorified. All these things we commit to you, Lord, praying that you would do more than we can ask or imagine. In the name of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. So my question in my title is, what is biblical theology? And the first thing that I want to do is give you my answer to that question, and then we could be done. <laughs> Actually, we'll continue, but here's, here's my answer to the question, what is biblical theology? Biblical theology is the attempt to understand and embrace the interpretive perspective of the biblical authors. The attempt to understand the interpretive perspective of the biblical authors really means we're trying to get at their worldview. We're trying to get at how they saw the world, how they interpreted the world, how they looked at earlier scripture, how they interpreted earlier scripture, and then after we've understood this, we want to embrace this. So in other words, the way that Moses and Isaiah and David and John and Matthew and Paul and the author of Hebrews, the way that they saw the world is the way that we want to see the world. The way that they interpreted their lives is the way that we want to interpret our lives. The way that they read earlier scripture is the way that we want to read earlier scripture. Okay, so biblical theology is the attempt to understand and embrace the interpretive perspective of the biblical authors. The biblical authors often structure their messages in what's known as a chiasm. And um, I am going to use a chiastic structure for my presentation today. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, w as we try to understand their interpretive perspective, one of the things that we're trying to do is rightly understand the literary presentation that they've made to us. And then once we see... I, this is, so I'm, I'm modeling what I'm hoping you'll do. I, I see them using these chiastic structures, and then I'm adopting their method, okay? So we are going to begin and end this morning, a chiasm. The word chiasm comes from uh, the Greek letter chi, which looks like an X. And the idea is uh, you start at one point, and you're going to end at that same point. And really, this is, this is uh, the way that humans think. It's the way that our music works. Often the chord that you open a song with is the chord that you close the song with and so forth. So I'm going to start uh, and end with stories about uh, these two women. And then from there, my, my first step in from that, uh, I want to think with you just briefly about what Carl Truman refers to as the modern self in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. So this is an attempt to understand how people in our culture understand themselves and then Corresponding to that, so one step in from the beginning is the modern self. Uh, self. One step in from the end, 
I want to think with you briefly about two false gospels in our, in our, uh, our atmosphere, in our, in our shared world culture in the West, the false gospel of wokeness and the false gospel of uh, sexual fulfillment and this hyper-sexualized culture that we live in. And then the center of my chiastic structure, uh, where, where we're really going to spend the body of our time together, is a challenge that we live out of and into the true story. And the true story is really uh, a, a way of getting at uh, the, the Bible's uh, big story, uh, the, the, the controlling narrative, the master story that is in the scriptures that, that really informs all of biblical theology. Okay, so that's, that's, that's how this talk is, is structured. I'm going to begin with my first uh, little vignette or, or story about this woman. Her name is Julia Allison, and in 2018, uh, she... Uh, She's the subject of this article entitled, Dating Columnist Reveals How Sex in the City Ruined Her Life. So maybe you're familiar with this show that was on television in the United States called Sex in the City. And this dating columnist is revealing how sex in the city ruined her life. And, and listen to what she says. This is The reason I'm telling you about this woman, Julia Allison, is because... What the Bible's master story is meant to do for us is what the show Sex and the City did for her. It controlled her life. It, it was the, the, the master narrative out of which and into she lived. It was the story from which she derived her truths, her dogmas. It was the story that informed her values. So listen to what uh, the, 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 the article The the sort of abstract at the beginning says, Julia Allison moved to New York in the early 2000s to live the Carrie Bradshaw lifestyle. Carrie Bradshaw being the main character of this show, Sex and the City. And then it goes on to say, Allison, now 37, Julia Allison, now 37, this is 2018, so she's a little older now, tells Doree Lewak, if I could go back and do it all over again, I wouldn't. So this is a, a really sad, a tragic article. As, as she relates uh, her story, Julia Allison, she says this, I was, I was considered by many to be Carrie Bradshaw 2.0, and I was happy to be given that identity for a while. So you can see what's happening. The, the, the glamorous star of the show, the identity, is informing who this woman understands herself to be. She says, I was happy to be given that identity for a while, but it was all a lie. And, and, and then uh, she goes on. She says, the show was my roadmap. So think about what she's saying. She's saying that she, she watched these episodes that gave to her this, this kind of master meta narrative for understanding life and that became for her a road map for her finding her way in life and then and then this illustrates the next the next thing she says illustrates the way that we derive truths from the story of the world that we embrace we see this in the bible you know the uh, the, the opening chapters of the Bible relate how God made the man and the woman, and he brought the woman to the man, and the, woman, uh, the man names the woman. And then there's a conclusion that is drawn from that episode at the end of Genesis 2. And, and the, the, the narrator of Genesis says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So you're, you're getting the story told, And then a conclusion is drawn from the story about the way that people are to live. And I can remember uh, several years ago, I'm I'm here this week with my son Jake. Several years ago, I was in India, and I was talking about these realities. And I said the way that that biblical uh, religion, biblical faith works is different from all the other religions of the world because all of the other religions of the world, what they do is they make, they, they, they get a truth or a behavior that they want to advocate and then they make up a story that justifies the behavior. In biblical religion, 
The story results in the behavior. The way that God has made the world results in the conclusion about how people are to live. And, and as I was relating this, my, my friend Harshit Singh in Lucknow, India, he was translating for me, and he stops as I say, all these other religions, they, they, they find a truth or a, a behavior or a value that they want to advocate, and then they make up a story to, to fit it, and Harshit stops and he looks at me and he says, Hindus do that all the time. And, and, and I think this is true of all religions. So Carrie Bradshaw, she says, I, I'm sorry, not Carrie Bradshaw, uh, Julia Allison, but you can see how it works. The, the ty there's typology at work there, uh, which we'll explore in a coming session. Um, Julia Allison says, I also subscribed to Carrie's ethos when it came to men. And this is what's so devastatingly tragic about this particular article. She, she goes on to say, there was no such thing as a bad date, only a good date or a good brunch story. So you, you can see what she's saying. Uh, Carrie's lifestyle and her story informed Julia Allison's morality and how she evaluated the way that she had lived. And then as the article goes on, she says these sad and tragic words. She says, I do wonder what my life would have looked like if sex in the city had never cross a come across my consciousness. Perhaps I'd be married with children now. And then, then she says, this is, this is so interesting, it's such an interesting uh, statement about the way that sin destroys us and deceives us. She says, it's like candy. In the moment, it feels good to eat it, but afterward, you feel sick. Whom you're dating, what you're wearing, or how good you look at that premiere, none of that matters unless, and she says, and you can see the, the expressive individualism, uh, that's still informing her. She says, none of that matters unless you genuinely love yourself. Uh, she goes on, truth be told, I wish I had never heard of Sex in the City. I'm sure there are worse role models, but for me, it did permanent and measurable damage to my psyche that I'm still cleaning up. And in that comment, you can, you can hear the psychologized nature of her understanding of herself. So, uh, just, a, just a brief reflection on everything that Sex and the City provided for Julia Allison. It gave her an overarching narrative that explained her life and, and out of which she derived truths or, or dogmas, we might say. It also informed what she viewed as ethical behavior, uh, the values and ethics that flowed out of her narrative and then back into to reinforce the narrative. Uh, it, the, the, the story of the show, it, it told her what kind of behavior was to be commended and what kind of behavior was to be discouraged. It also gave her uh, symbols and images that would summarize and interpret and rein, uh, reinforce the narrative that she was trying to live. Now, I think that her narrative, the, the Sex and the City narrative, in, in all those ways, really gets at the way that these stories are worldview shaping. And as we get into biblical theology, we're, we're going to be thinking about the way that the Bible story is the master narrative out of which we, we derive truths about uh, how the world works, who we are, what the world is, and so forth, and also out of which we derive our understanding of what behavior is to be encouraged, what behavior is to be uh, discouraged. Uh, the Bible's narrative also gives us symbols and images. The Bible is even fuller, though, because it gives us liturgical responses of worship, how, how to respond uh, in, in ways that are appropriate to thank and praise the one to whom all these things uh, are due. And, and, and worldviews regularly include this. So if you, if you think, for instance, of the way that uh, epic poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey function in, in uh, Western culture, but back when they were produced in the Greek culture out of which they came, what's being celebrated in those poems are 
are the, the heroic actions of the, the, the characters and also the interventions of the gods. And so the, 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 the statements of, th- of thanks and praise are in response to the great actions of the heroes and the interventions of the gods. And the Bible includes epic poetry, the Psalter, that is to be understood as responding to and retelling uh, the actions, really, of the hero of the story, which is God himself. And uh, the, the, often, uh, David is the speaker of the psalm, and I think David understands himself to be prefiguring uh, the one who is to come, the promised Savior who is to come. And again, we'll get into this in a coming session together. So liturgical responses of worship is also included in here. And then um, another thing that Sex and the City did for Julia Allison was it, it shaped a group of people who thought that this way of understanding the world and this way of living was normal. It was, it was the right way to live. And, and that's another aspect of the way that biblical theology is to function among us. It's to, it's to form a group of people who agree on what normal living, thinking, responding in praise, understanding symbolism and imagery, all of this, where we have a group of people who agree on what's normal, we have a culture. And so the Bible's theology... The theology of the biblical authors is meant to shape our culture. Okay, so that's my beginning with uh, Julia Allison. Second uh, step here, um, how does biblical theology transform the modern self? And so really what I want to do is think with you for just a moment about some things that Carl Truman has helped us to understand in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. He points out how... People in our culture are psychologized. And, and what he means by that is the way that we, we have become people who look inward so that how we feel and, and what our own inner responses to our experiences are, this is now authoritative. Uh, on the flight over um, the, the other night, uh, I watched the movie The Iron Lady about Margaret Thatcher. And, and even in the 1970s and 1980s, Margaret Thatcher was objecting to the way that people were no longer thinking, they were just feeling. So instead of responding rationally or instead of consulting a, a source of truth outside of themselves, they were just responding to their own feelings about the way that things were. This is, this is pervasive in our day. Um, as believers... We want to be people who take every thought captive to the knowledge of Christ. We we cannot be people who who only operate operate in psychologized ways. We we have to understand what the scriptures teach about who we are and what's happened to us and how we're to respond. So we've been psychologized. We've also been sexualized. And what this means, uh, as Truman explains, and I'm just going to quote him here, He says, to be sexually inactive is to be a less than whole person, to be obviously unfulfilled or weird. Which, you know, if you you take that thought, to be sexually inactive is to be a less than whole person. And and you can see this all over the place in our culture. Um, Have you all seen the recent movie Death on the Nile? Anyone seen the movie Death on the Nile? Nobody in the room. Uh, one person. Well, that's great. Anyone read the book, Death on the Nile, by uh, Agatha Christie? Oh, that's okay. It's a, it's a murder mystery. And um, um, it's, it's really, I, I listened to the book, and then, again, on the flight over, I, I, I watched about the first hour of, of, of the movie, the recently produced movie. And one thing that jumped out at me was that in the book, the murderer's motivation was money, uh, which, you know, it's not, a new, it's not a new thing for someone to want money and, um, and kill for money. But, but what was so different about the recently produced movie was the, how sexualized it was. The, all of that was lacking from the book, which was written in the early 1900s. I don't know when she wrote that book, 1930s, 1940s, I'm, I, I don't remember. Um, 
But all of that focus on sex that's in the movie was not in the book. Why do the movie makers do this? Because this is what people in our culture are interested in. This is what we think is fulfilling. And, and if we agree with this idea to be sexually inactive is to be a less than whole person, well, we're <laughs> saying that Jesus was a less than whole person, which is, which is ludicrous. Uh, but just to, just to sit on this idea of our culture being sexualized for just a moment, consider the words of Psalm 1611. Uh, and I'm thinking of this phrase, in your presence is fullness of joy. And I think that for many people in our culture, if we were to ask them to, to take the phrase fullness of joy and then, and then say, say to them, where do you expect to find fullness of joy? They may not articulate it, but I suspect that many, many people in our culture would be thinking in terms of sexual fulfillment. They would be, they would be equating fullness of joy with their, their, their sexual pleasure, their, their, whether that's their fantasy life or their whatever they hope to happen in, in, their, in their lives. We could also take that other phrase in Psalm 1611, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And here, you know, I don't, I don't want us to just look out at what people in our culture think. We should also look in, into our own hearts. And, and I would ask you, where do your appetites and your affections go when you hear a phrase like pleasures forevermore? If, if, if you're honest with yourself, and if you're honest about what you desire, when you hear a phrase like, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore, is it true that, that in your own heart you would think to yourself, yes, the presence of God in the new heavens and new earth, in the resurrected body, this is what I lie in bed at night and think about as I'm going to sleep. When, when, I, when, I, when I'm seeking pleasure, what I, what I go to, in my own heart, when no one can see my thoughts, is the Lord at your right hand. Are, is that what you think? Or do you think um, of, of money or sex or, or power or uh, I, I don't, uh, some sinful self-gratification? So uh, biblical theology, our story is meant to transform us at these levels. We want to become people who... Are, are overcoming the way that our culture has sexualized us and embracing the Bible's master narrative, understanding how it informs our, 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 the things that we know to be true, our dogmas, and, and then having it shape our understanding of what behaviors are to be commended, what behaviors are to be discouraged, having the symbols and the images work on us, embracing the, the, the culture that this creates, this is all part of the, the, the renewal of our minds that comes about as we, as we uh, reflect on, meditate on, memorize, and, and seek to live our lives out of and back into the scriptures. So the modern self has been psychologized, it's been sexualized, and then finally, Truman argues, it's been politicized. And, and we see this all around us. Uh, the, the, the thing that Truman focuses on is the way that the inner psychological feelings about sexual preferences and choices of particularly the LGBTQ population is now thought, it, it, it's now taken for granted that their psycholo psycholo psychological feelings must be affirmed in law and throughout the culture. And, and so all of these things, the psychology, the sex, is, it's all being politicized. Again, biblical theology is meant to transform all of this for us. It's meant to make us people who know that we are the subjects of King Jesus who is going to come and reign. And then it's meant to enable us to live now as people who, who understand uh, what this world is, what it was created to be, who we are, how we were created to live, and... Um, uh, how we are to go about bringing our values into line with the Bible story. Okay, so Julia Allison, the modern self, and now uh, some thoughts on biblical theology living out of and into the true story. I want to start thinking with you about this 
uh, by thinking about what this place is, the setting for the Bible story. And if you have a copy of the Bible, and I would invite you to look with me briefly at Psalm 78, uh, and I, I just want to drop in um, at verse 67 and just read a few verses here. Psalm 78, 67 and following. And, and really what I'm getting at here, so we're now, we're now to the section of, the, of my, my little talk here uh, at, that's at the center of my chiastic structure, and it's on living out of and into the true story. And we're going to start with the setting of the story. How do we think about the world in which we live? And the psalmist, uh, this guy Asaph, I think that, who, who wrote Psalm 78, I think that he has rightly understood what Moses intended to communicate in Genesis, in the creation narrative, and in Exodus, in the narrative about the instructions for the tabernacle, and then the building of the tabernacle. And so Asaph, in response to Moses, he, and, and in response to the developments of the Lord choosing David, he writes this in verse 67 of the Lord, he rejected the tent of Joseph. Now what, what Asaph is saying is, the Lord did not choose a Messiah from the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. The Lord rejected uh, the tribe of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But, verse 68, he chose the tribe of Judah. Now, if we were to go back and study the book of Genesis, if we had time to do that, I think uh, it is evident that Moses is anticipating the Lord doing this. And, and one of the ways that, that um, uh, Moses does this is when Joseph has the dreams. You remember the Lord, it's, it's as though the Lord identifies Joseph as the one who is chosen from among the, the, the 12 sons of Jacob. As Joseph has these dreams in which, in one of them, um, the sun and the moon, which represents his father and mother, and then the, the, the 11 stars, his brothers, they come and bow down to him. And in, in the other dreams, they're binding sheaves, and the sheaves of all the brothers come and bow down to Joseph. Well, the way that Moses um, shows this transition from Joseph as the chosen, chosen one to Judah as the chosen one is he, has, he, he, he tells the story of how Joseph gets sold into slavery, and then um, uh, uh, um, one of the brothers is taken captive when they go down to buy grain from Joseph in Egypt, and then Joseph demands that Benjamin come if they're going to get more grain. And then uh, Reuben says to his father, send Benjamin with me and I'll give my two sons a surety. And if I don't bring your son back, you can kill my sons. And uh, Jacob doesn't want anything to do with that plan. And then Judah steps forward. And Judah says, essentially, my life for his. My life. I will be surety for Benjamin. And so it, Judah steps forward in this way. And, and there's this self-giving Christ-likeness at work in, in Judah's offer. And then when Joseph seizes Benjamin... Judah, Judah makes the longest speech in the book of Genesis, and it is an amazing speech that, that reveals Judah's love for his father, Jacob, and Jacob doesn't love Judah's, or, or Jacob doesn't deserve Judah's love, and, and Judah loves him uh, better than Jacob deserved to, deserves to be loved, and it also shows Judah's love for Benjamin. I mean, imagine a situation where you're an old, you've got a younger brother who is clearly your father's favorite. And uh, that, that favorite of your father is, is taken captive. What kind of love results in that older brother saying, I will give my life for my younger brother to be restored to my father? That's what Judah stepped forward to do. It's, it's an amazingly uh, Christ-like act. And then at the end of the book, as, as Jacob is blessing Judah, he takes that terminology from Joseph's dreams. The brother's and, and parents bowing down to Joseph. And Jacob says of Judah, may your, may your mother's sons bow down before you. And it's as though the, the status of Joseph is shifted to Judah within the book of Genesis. And, and uh, Asaph is picking up on this in light of the way that uh, the promises were made to one from Judah when they were made to David. Asaph says in verse 68 of Psalm 78, he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount 
Zion. So this is referring to the way that uh, the threshing floor of Arauna was marked out by the Lord as the place where the temple would be built. Mount Zion, which he loves. And then verse 69 says this. He built his sanctuary. So this is talking about the dwelling place, the temple that, that Solomon would build. And it says, he built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth which he has founded forever. So the comparison here is between the sanctuary and the heavens and the earth. And the psalmist is saying that the temple was built like the heavens and the earth. And, and what he's picking up on, what Asaph is picking up on, is the way that Moses has forged these connections between the, the narrative of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 and 2 and the narrative of the construction, the instructions for and construction of the tabernacle in uh, Exodus 25 through 40, which, which leads to the conclusion that the creation was built by God as a cosmic temple. And this idea was, it, it's, it's well articulated in G.K. Beale's book, The Temple and the Church's Mission, but far more important than any piece of scholarship, this idea is meant to, to inform how we understand the world in which we live. The world is not just a set of resources for us to exploit. It's not just a, a context in which, for us, in which we enjoy our lives. The world is God's cosmic temple. Isaiah 66, 1. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What's the footstool uh, of the Lord in the Old Testament? Well, it's the, the Ark of the Covenant, right? Which is in the Holy of Holies. And so the, it's as though the Lord is saying, the earth is my Holy of Holies. It's my dwelling place. If we think of the world this way, if we think of the setting in which the, the, the drama of our lives, in which these, these lives are enacted, if we think of that setting as a cosmic temple, all these connotations of holiness, all these requirements for cleanliness, all of these, these uh, symbolic depictions of God's purity, of his his devotion to his own glory, all of this that we, that we learn from Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus about who God is and how he relates to people begins to inform how we think about the world in which we live. This world, we should think of this world as God's cosmic temple. Uh, so the setting of the story. Now the, the plot of the story. The setting of the story, this is a cosmic temple. The plot of the story. We'll look more at this uh, in, in our next session that I, that I will do when we look at, um, at Genesis 3. What I want to say here is uh, there is this, um, this major problem introduced in Genesis 3. And that problem is the way that God... God makes man in his image and in his likeness to reflect his glory and character. And, and you, can, you can really, I think, helpfully get your mind around how this works, how this was intended to work, by comparing it to what the idolaters do. So in the ancient Near East, uh, Mario and I were talking about this earlier this morning at breakfast, in the ancient Near East, the idolaters would build these temples... And then into that temple really represented the sphere of their God's sovereignty, the area over which their God reigned, which this again points to the idea of the, the, the earth as a cosmic temple. Uh, the earth is a depiction of the heavens and the earth over which the true God reigns entirely. And then into this, this small-scale replica of the, the domain of their God's sovereignty into that small-scale replica, they would put a visible representation of their invisible God. And that visible statue, which was either uh, carved out of rock or um, made of molten uh, metal or, or, you know, shaped from wood or something, however they constructed it, that statue was meant to represent the character, the presence and the authority of their invisible God. Now, in the true story, in the real story, 
God didn't build a small-scale replica. He built the cosmos. And then he didn't put a block of wood or stone or molten metal into his small-scale replica. He put a living, breathing, replicating, worshiping image and likeness of his character, authority, presence, and rule. And so one of the, one of the most surprising uh, thing, I think one of the most surprising statements in the Bible is Genesis 1.28, where having made man and woman in his image and likeness, the next words that we read are, and God blessed them. You know, and, and the reason this is so surprising is because we, we naturally think of God being like us. And, and that results in uh, various uh, explanations for how, how the gods, various expectations for how the gods respond to humanity. You know, so um, there, there's, there are ancient Near Eastern stories about how the, the reason that God made humans was because, the reason the gods made humans is because they needed slaves to do the work. And then uh, we can think of the way that there, there are these stories from the Greco-Roman world about how the gods did not want people to have good gifts like fire. And so fire had to be stolen from the gods. And it's so surprising with those kinds of expectations when we come to the Bible and God makes man and he's happy about it and he blessed them. And, and it's, it's really, it's transformative of all of these negative expectations and negative inclinations that we have uh, that have to do with frustration and, and oppression and, and um, this miserly hoarding of good gifts. No, God, that's not how God relates to his creation. He blessed them. And said to them, this is so important, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Now, when we think about this, it's as though God has said, I've just built this cosmic temple and now I've put my image into it and I want my image to reproduce and fill the cosmic temple. Well, what is God saying? What he's saying is, I want those who represent my character, my authority, my presence, I want them to pervade the cosmic temple. In other words, in that, in that mandate in Genesis 1.28, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, God is essentially saying to those who bear his image, fill the world with my glory. Fill the world as, as representatives of my presence, those who bear my image and likeness. Fill the world as those who will, who will reign, you know, be fruitful and multiply and, uh, sorry, let me start over. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply uh, and, and uh, fill the world and subdue it and have dominion. That dominion part has to do with the exercise of their authority and their authority is really God's authority. As they reign over creation... People are meant to, to reflect God's character, who he is, and how he conducts himself, his ways in all the world. Okay, so um, it, you start with that in Genesis 1.28. By the time you get to Genesis 6, I think it's Genesis 6.11, Moses has written, the earth, God saw that the earth was filled with violence. So they're to fill the world as those who bear God's image and likeness. Yeah, Genesis 6, 11. The earth was corrupted in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. So rather than fill the world with God's glory, uh, because of Genesis 3, uh, there is this corruption and this filling of the world with bloodshed and violence and this ruination of, of God's creation. But as we continue... Through the, through the story, and really, we'll look at it in, a, in the next session when we consider Genesis 3. Um, God has made this promise about this seed of the woman, and that promise is developed and elaborated on in the promise that God makes to Abraham um, to make him uh, a, great, a great nation, and to make him a great name, and to give him land, seed, and blessing. And in, tho in those promises... To Abraham, it's as though God is saying, 
that the words of judgment with which the world has been cursed in Genesis 3 are going to be overcome with these words of blessing that I'm now speaking. Blessing that has to do with offspring, seed. Blessing that has to do with the renewal of the land. And, and blessing, I think, ultimately that has to do with God's covenantal presence with his people to ensure their joy and their provision in, in, in God's promise to bless them. So he says, I will bless those who bless you, Genesis 12, 3, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the setting of the story, this is a cosmic temple. The plot of the story, those who were made to reflect the character of God himself, the image and those who were made in the image and likeness of God, have, have, have rebelled against God and, and defiled the cosmic temple. But in his words of promise, God is saying, I'm, essentially, I'm going to renew this cosmic temple. I'm going to overcome the words of, 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 of cursing. And I'm going to overcome, I think the Lord is promising, I'm going to overcome sin and death itself. And, and fill the world with life. Okay, so we have this, this big plot that unfolds across the scriptures. And that plot, we'll explore this in the session that we uh, look at typology together um, in. The plot is really tied together as the biblical authors use and reuse uh, statements made by earlier biblical authors. So people will often talk about the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Well, before you even get to that, you've got the use of the Old Testament in the Old Testament. And before you get to that, you've got the use of Moses in Moses. So as, as phrases from earlier in the Bible are repeated across the scriptures... It's, it, 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 it forges this continuity in the story. One of the ways that this is accomplished within the book of Genesis, uh, we'll just, just think with me briefly about this. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and so forth. Listen to Genesis 9.1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So there's this continuity that's created between Adam's responsibility and Noah's responsibility. And, and one of the conclusions that we draw from the way that the narrative is told to us is, is a line of thinking that goes like this. Noah is a new Adam. And then one of the things that we notice, if we, if we step back from the story, we we immerse ourselves in the details of the story, and then we step back from the story and we reflect on the story. And when we do this, we, we start noticing that there are these repeated sequences of events. And so, for instance, um, Adam, he takes forbidden fruit, and, and he eats it, transgressing God's command, and his shameful nakedness is exposed. And then God comes, and God speaks words of cursing and judgment and words of blessing. Well, Noah, he's going to take the fruit of the vine, and he's going to transgress with it. He's going to get good and drunk, and then his shameful nakedness is exposed, and then words of cursing are spoken with reference to Ham, and then words of blessing are spoken with reference to Shem and Japheth. So there are these, these repetitions. This, there's, there's this pattern of events, and then these, these repetitions of that pattern. And, and then that kind of thing is, is going to be repeated as we, as we move through. Um, so, for instance, um, Noah is going to be preserved through waters, the flood, in which all of his contemporaries die on this ark. And then we're going to have this character named Moses, who is going to be put into an ark. That's the word that's translated basket, at least in the English translations. I don't know what the Dutch translations do. Uh, but the English translations render the word basket. And... Um, um, Moses is put in the ark into the waters of the Nile in which all of his contemporaries are intended, at least by the Egyptians, to die. And then in the same way that Noah gets off the ark and enters into covenant with God, having delivered this small remnant of people, Moses is going to deliver the people of... He's going to come out of the ark, deliver the people of, of Israel at the Exodus, and then he's going to 
be the mediator of the covenant between God and Israel at Mount Sinai. And then in the same way that the world was corrupted in God's sight and God intended to blot out humanity at the flood, uh, in, in Exodus 32, the people of Israel become corrupted when they sin with the golden calf. And it uses the same Hebrew verb shakat to describe the corruption that was used back in, in Genesis 6. And then um, the Lord says to Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. And he uses the same verb to describe the wiping out of the people of Israel that was used to describe the wiping out of the people at the flood. And, and there, there are so many, of, so many ways in, in which you have these correspondences between Noah and Moses. For instance, uh, Noah, Genesis 6, 8, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And Moses says to the Lord in Exodus 33, you have said to me uh, I, that, that I have found favor in your sight. And it uses a, the, almost the exact same Hebrew expression to describe Moses finding favor in God's sight. So we could say Moses is a new Noah and Noah was a new Adam. And we're having these the, these repetitions in the patterns of events as you move across the storyline, and it's forging these, these typological uh, developments as you go from, from Adam to Noah to Moses, and, and it's creating a sense of continuity as you go through the story. So the setting of the story is the cosmic temple. The plot, is intro, the, the, the plot conflict is introduced by... Uh, sin in Genesis 3, the resolution to that plot, plot conflict is promised by the Lord, and then the continuity of the whole story is un unfolded as we see the way that Moses teaches later biblical authors to understand how there is this continuity and, and there are these patterns as we move across the story. So... Uh, at many points, these things that I'm, that I'm describing, they will be uh, summarized and encapsulated by these, um, these symbolic images that will, that will interpret the story, that will reinforce the story. And one of the most important uh, uh, sim symbols and uh, images, one of the most important of these is the image of the, the, the newborn child whose birth was remarkable. And to, to build toward this, I just want to think with you briefly about the birth of Isaac before we, before we move forward in the Bible story and think about this, this theme of, of uh, the remarkable birth of the child whose life um, uh, symbolizes the overcoming of death. And, and so let me just say a word about the literary structure of Genesis 12 through 22. Um, it's remarkable how uh, Genesis 12, um, the Lord says to Abraham, Genesis 12, 1, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now listen to the words of Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, that's the word order in the Hebrew text, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Uh, these two, I think that Moses has intentionally structured these two opening statements, the opening statement of Genesis 12 and the opening statement of Genesis 22, so that we see the similarity between the three things that he's to leave and these, this threefold description of, of Isaac in Genesis 22, and then this uh, specified but unspecified location to which he's to go. Go to the land of which I will tell you. Uh, go to the mountains of Moriah, and one of them I'll, I'll designate for you when you get there. And in Genesis 12, it's as though Abraham is called to leave his past. In Genesis 22, it's as though he's being called to, to offer up his future. And so... Um, there, there are these remarkable ways in which uh, Genesis 12 and Genesis, really Genesis 21 and 22 correspond to one another. Uh, later in Genesis 12, we'll read about the, the sister fib incident that uh, Abraham, when he, when he says that, when he passes Sarah off as his sister when they go down into to Egypt. 
And then uh, right before Isaac is born, and it's really it's, it's, uh, devastating as, as, you, as you come to appreciate this in the narrative, um, in, in Genesis 20, when Abraham redoes the sister fib episode, uh, Sarah very well could be pregnant at that point with Isaac. And, and Abraham is passing her off as his sister, and she's seized by this foreign king and taken into his harem, jeopardizing the, the ability to, to demonstrate that Isaac is actually Abraham's son, you know, if, if, if things go badly. But the Lord, the Lord delivers them, but Abraham's folly is amazing. Anyway, those, those two sister fib episodes, they stand across from one another in the chiastic stru- structure of Genesis 12 through 22. And then within that, Genesis 13 and 14 and Genesis 18 and 19 are two chapters uh, on each side that deal with, with Lot and uh, destruction and deliverance. So in, in Genesis 13, you know, Abraham gives Lot the opportunity to choose the land. Genesis 14, Sodom is destroyed by the foreign king and Lot is carried off captive and Abraham has to go rescue him. Genesis 18, um, the Lord appears to Abraham and tells him he's going to destroy Sodom. And then in Genesis 19, Lot is delivered from Sodom. Um, so Lot and Sodom figure in 13 and 14 and 18 and 19. Within that, you have these, these three chapters that deal with God's promises to Abraham and the covenants that God makes to Abraham, particularly Genesis 15 and 17. Genesis 15, Abraham believed the Lord and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Uh, Abraham uh, cuts the animals in half. The smoking fire pot passes between them. The Lord covenants with Abraham. Genesis 17, God gives Abraham the covenant of circumcision. In the middle of all that, as they're, they're trying to have a child, they go about it in a, in a fleshly way. And, and Abraham takes Hagar as his wife. And it's, it's as though Abraham's sinful attempt to bring about God's promise by the power of his own flesh is being surrounded and enveloped by God's merciful covenant promises in Genesis 15 and 17. So all of this is building up to this miraculous birth of this child, Isaac. And... Uh, when we understand the significance of the birth of this child, you know, um, Abraham and Sarah, we're told in Romans 4 and in the book of Genesis, that they're both as good as dead. As, their bodies are infertile. They have, the promise has been standing for 25 years, and they've been waiting, and no life has come from their union. And then God miraculously brings life out of death when Isaac is born. And the birth of Isaac symbolically is like life from the dead. So the birth of a child from a barren woman symbolically uh, connotes resurrection from, from death, resurrection from the dead. And in a way, this corresponds... To the, to the promise in Genesis 3.15, because in that context, the man and the woman have no right to expect anything from God but death. God had clearly said to them in Genesis 2.17, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. They eat of it, he comes, they try to hide, they can't, they, they, they expect nothing but death, and he promises a child. So the promise of that child in Genesis 3.15 it's almost like life out of death there too. And then you get life out of death at the birth of Isaac. And then we're also told that Rebecca is barren. And, and Isaac and Rebecca, they're married for 20 years before Jacob and Esau come along. So there's this similarity between the 25-year wait for Isaac to be born and then the 20-year wait for Jacob and Esau to be born. And then we're told that Rachel is barren. And... and uh, it's a long time before any children, uh, before Joseph comes along from, from Rachel's womb. So it's as though we're getting in the book of Genesis this pattern of these, these children born to barren mothers and the births of these children connote life from the dead. And, and I think that all of this informs um, Isaiah chapter 7. It informs other things along the way. But in Isaiah 7... Um, uh, Isaiah is sent to King Ahaz, and he is to, to say to the king um, that he is not to be bothered about these, 
two kings that are trying to take him out and, and set up their own political puppet in the land. And so um, Isaiah, I'm going to start reading in Isaiah chapter 7. Um, I'll start reading in verse 4 where Isaiah is to say to Ahaz, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. At the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, Rezin is the, the king of Syria, and the son of Remaliah, that's Pekah, he's the king of the northern kingdom, Israel, because Syria with Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom of Israel, and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand. Okay, so Ahaz is king in Judah, the southern kingdom, and the two kings to his north are aligned against him, and they're going to take him out. That's what they're planning to do, set up their own puppet. And the Lord says, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. And then listen to what he says in verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus. Okay, so Damascus is the capital city of Syria, and the Lord starts talking about it being a head. The head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Rezin is the king in Damascus. And within 65 years, Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom of Israel, will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. So you've got these two head statements uh, bracketing this shattered statement in the middle. So you've got a chiastic structure there in Isaiah uh, 8 and 9. Well, why do you think Isaiah would be talking about the enemies of God, the enemies of the king from the line of Judah, as though those enemies are heads that are about to be crushed or shattered? Why, why, I wonder why he would be talking this way. I think what Isaiah is doing is he is using symbolic imagery drawn from Genesis 3.15 Essentially to say to, to Ahaz, Ahaz, you need to be trusting God's promises. You need to be thinking about the world as God's cosmic temple in which this drama that God is sovereign over is being worked out. And you need to be thinking about these events that you're facing in light of the promises that God has made beginning from Genesis 3.15. And then he tells him at the end of verse 9, if you are not firm in faith, and here I think for Ahaz to be firm in faith would be for Ahaz to say, God made a promise about the seed of the woman. I'm in that line of descent. God's going to keep his promises to God's people. God's going to protect us. That's what it would be for Ahaz to be for, and, and it would then result in Ahaz saying, Isaiah is the prophet of God. Isaiah is speaking for the Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to align with Isaiah. I'm going to go with what Isaiah is saying. That, that's what it would be for Ahaz to be firm in faith. If you are not firm in faith, Isaiah says to Ahaz, you will not be firm at all. And then, so, so you can see how symbolism and imagery are working here if we understand the story. Then he continues in verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. Now, it's interesting that he mentions Sheol uh, because Sheol is the, is the place of the dead. And, um, um, you know, there they're, they're, there are all these interesting um, um, associations uh, of, of, of death and, and where the dead are. And it, it, Anyway, Ahaz said, verse 12, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test, which it sounds like a pious thing to say, but it's one of those pious things that somebody who's not pious at all says when they're trying to be pious. And, and, and Isaiah sees right through it, and he says in verse 13, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? There, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Immanuel, and that term means uh, God is with us. Now, I think that, that um, uh, when Isaiah says this, a lot of earlier biblical, if, if, if Ahaz was a man, like the blessed man of Psalm 1, who meditated on the law of the Lord day and night, 
a lot of earlier biblical imagery and patterns and stories would be activated for him. They're not going to be activated for him. And the reason they're not going to be activated for him is because he doesn't delight himself in the law of the Lord. He's not a Psalm 1 blessed man. But what would be activated for, the, for a Psalm 1 blessed man kind of person would be things like this. Uh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it looked like everything was over. It looks like everything's over for me right now. But, but God spoke life into their situation in the promise in Genesis 3.15. When God made the promise to Abraham that he would son, have a son, at numerous points it looked like everything. When they went down into Egypt and, and Pharaoh seized Sarah, it looked like everything was over. God got them out of that. Uh, then they, they flub it up with Hagar, and it looks like surely they've blown it. And all God did with that was just surround it with his covenantal mercies. And then um, Abraham pleads with the Lord to bless Ishmael. And the Lord refuses to do, to do that and reaffirms that, that he's going to give a son to Abraham from Sarah. They're married for 25 years. They're as good as dead. And God brings life through this child. And, and so this promise of a, a child born of a virgin would activate all of these patterns from the story. This, this image, this symbolism, which is going to become real in the immediate future, would activate all of these earlier patterns and promises, which would make Ahaz firm in faith if he was a man of the book. It doesn't do that for Ahaz. And, um, um, and yet, and yet uh, God is faithful to his promise. And, and I think from this immediate context, a child was born in the near future, and we also know a child would be born in the distant future, um, and, and, and Jesus would be, fulfilled, would be born in fulfillment of Isaiah 7. Uh, there's a lot more that we could say about this, but what I'm trying to illustrate is the way that the, the biblical authors use symbolism and imagery, and this is going to continue. I mean, we could, we could find this from so many places. The biblical authors use symbolism and imagery to summarize, interpret, and reinforce the big story, the master narrative. So we've got a setting, we've got a plot, a plot conflict, its resolution, the way that symbols and imagery um, respond to that. And then we've, got, we've also got um, um, liturgical responses of, of thanks and praise. We'll look at those when we, when we consider the Psalter in, in um, a coming session. And then we've got a culture in which, in which this is normal, in which it's normal to think the thoughts of the biblical writers. And this brings me to the way that we must today reject the false gospels of our woke and hypersexualized culture. And so I just want to read to you Colossians 2.8 and Ephesians 5.6. Here's Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. I actually don't think that's the way it it works exactly in our culture. I think it's because of our, our, our psychologized feeling culture. I think it's far more likely for Christians today to be taken captive as they don't think through the implications of the, the sense that they should feel a certain way. The sense that they should go along with a certain sentiment, a certain feeling that hasn't really been examined. It hasn't really been analyzed. It hasn't really been tested against the actual evidence, against the facts. It just feels right. I think that's the way that we're more likely to be taken captive today. So it's not going to be philosophical reasoning that's deceitful. It's going to be, I think, in our culture, uh, feelings and, and the sense of what's right, this, this false... Uh, public virtue that's really based upon nothing, nothing true. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So just briefly, woke culture. Um, we have to see this as a false gospel, and it's really a false version of biblical theology. They, they have a, a different account of, 
what original sin is. So for woke, woke culture, original sin is not uh, the man and the woman transgressing the commandment of God in the garden. It's either racism or sexism or ableism or hetero, heteronormativity or, or some other expression of these interlocking forms of oppression whereby those supposedly in power are using their privilege to to impose themselves and take advantage of those who are being oppressed. And and I I would encourage you to take these categories that you're probably familiar with of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and and just walk through these ideologies. So, So we ask ourselves... Is the origin story satisfying? And, and ultimately, I think what, what we'll find again and again and again is that the origin story is not satisfying. The origin story that informs woke culture, it doesn't account for all of creation in the way that the Bible, stories does. The, the Bible story does. Um, their, their account of the fall, does their analysis of the original sin go deep enough. And I think again and again we'll find, no, it doesn't. It doesn't go deep enough. Uh, The claims of of either racism or sexism or ableism or the the problem of supposedly of heteronormativity, it doesn't really analyze the depths of human wickedness and sin in the way that we need those things analyzed. Is there any kind of redemption? No. Is there any atonement or reconciliation? Nope. What does their version of heaven look like? The question of of restoration. We can do this same thing uh, to our hyper-sexualized culture in which your sexual desire defines you and and sexual fulfillment is supposed to satisfy you. We can ask ourselves the question, (coughs) were people really created for genital pleasure to be their highest end and their ultimate experience? And... and, and Does the lack of that account for what's wrong with the world? What about the lingering guilt, shame, harm, and devastation that results from all of this? What does their heaven look like? I think in our hypersexualized culture, their heaven looks like something filthy. It looks like something perverse. It it, it leaves you feeling dirty. Okay, so told my story about the first woman, uh, we talked about the modern self, we spent our time uh, with the, uh, the challenge to live out of and into the true story, and then we, we thought briefly about our, the false gospels of our woke and, woke and hypersexualized culture, and now my second story about a woman. Um, this young lady, um, when she was, I think, I think she was 13 years old, her parents put, a, put her into this very exclusive British uh, private school. And maybe you've heard this story. Uh, Maybe you'll recognize it as I tell it. At this school, there were some students who were day students, and there were some students who lived at the school. Uh, This particular young young lady was a a day student. And um, uh, this meant that at the school, there was this established culture of people who uh, they they, they lived at the school, and they, they, frankly, they bullied this young woman who was a day student. And um, um, this, this, this young lady that I'm telling you, you about, she has, um, um, as she has come into her own, she has uh, initiated programs against bullying in, in uh, uh, the place where she has influence. But story, when, when she rose to prominence, uh, they went and interviewed classmates of hers. Uh, from from the days when she was at the school. And one of her classmates said this about her. They said, um, when she was at that school, she was considered by the whole of our peer group as a non-entity. I mean, they're basically saying she was nothing. And and, and another one of her classmates recounted that these students, these young ladies at the school, were so mercilessly brutal in their in their relentless harassment of this young lady. That on one occasion, this particular girl, she, she came around a corner to a, a, a stairwell, and this, this girl was weeping on the stairs. She was seated on the stairs by, her, by herself, and she was just a puddle of tears. And she only lasted 
maybe a year. It might have been only a semester that she stayed at that school before her parents removed her from that situation because it was so, it was so um, horrific for her. Uh, the, the young lady that I'm telling you about is Kate Middleton, uh, who would later uh, marry the prince. And on her wedding day, there would be millions of people in the streets of London to admire her beauty, to celebrate her glory, and to see this fairy tale wedding. And, and you know, th- this, is a human situ- this is a human story, right? So Kate Middleton, she's just a human being, but... She seems to be in a marriage with a husband who really loves her now. And that husband is the the prince of England. And she is uh, likely to be, you know, the king's wife, it seems. Uh, He's at least in line. And, And so imagine if you could have a snapshot of her wedding day. I mean, you know, the the balcony at Buckingham Palace with the the guards out there doing their marching and uh, the band and and those throngs and throngs of people. Imagine if you had like an an aerial photo of that scene and you could come to this young lady weeping on the stairs and show her that photo and say to her, this is your wedding day. This is what it's going to be like for you. How would that affect her response to, to, to the trials and difficulties that she was dealing with in that school. How would that affect her response to these, I mean, I think we could say in, in relationship to where she is now, these non-entities who were bullying her. I, and, 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 and the challenge for us is to, say, is to really immerse ourselves in the Scripture So that we know what this place is, so that we believe the story, so that we believe the promises, so that it's like we're on the stairwell with the snapshot, with the photograph of of Christ on the white horse and the heavens open and we are clothed in garments of fine white linen, which are the righteous deeds of the saints and we receive all those promises that the Lord Jesus makes to the churches in the book of Revelation. That, that's, that's what biblical theology is intended to do for us. It is intended to trans- transform us from being modern selves in, inhabiting um, a, a, a culture that is pervaded with false gospels into being Christians who respond uh, out of the scriptures. I think I'm over time. I apologize. Um, maybe I'm right on time. I don't know if you want to take questions or you want us to conclude. What should we do at this point?